As you know, October is Respect Life Month. Two weeks ago in my homily, I shared with you what the church teaches about abortion and why it is a preeminent concern of the church today. In today's homily, I will share with you what the church teaches about some other issues of the gospel of life. Being pro-life is much more than just protecting the life of the unborn. But before I do that, I want to address some feedback I received from my homily two weeks ago. I realize that in an election year, there is an inherent risk on preaching on the gospel of life. In a diverse congregation such as ours, people hear many different things. Some felt I was right on, while some interpreted my homily two weeks ago as an endorsement to re-elect President Trump. I want to make it absolutely clear that I was not endorsing President Trump, nor am I endorsing any candidate or political party. As a representative of the Catholic Church, I am prohibited from publicly endorsing any candidate or political party, and I take that restriction very seriously. I do, however, have the responsibility to inform Catholic voters what the church teaches on many of the issues facing us today. My homily two weeks ago focused on abortion. My homily today will focus on some of the other issues of respect life. With that said, it is clear that the platforms of both major political parties do not fully embrace all the implications of the gospel of life and the teachings of the Catholic Church. So here is what I do endorse. One, that all Catholics read the United States Bishop's document, Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship. It is a call to political responsibility for Catholics. This document addresses the Catholic Church's rightful involvement in politics and the issues of protecting human life, promoting family life, pursuing social justice, and practicing global solidarity. The document is on our website in English and Spanish. And two, assuming that you read, reflect, and pray with this document, you vote according to your well-formed conscience. Also, some felt that my statement at the end of my homily that all lives matter trivialized the current movement of Black Lives Matter following the deaths of several black citizens at the hands of police officers. And worse yet, that I condoned the status quo. Let me make it absolutely clear that black lives do matter. The church believes this. I believe this, as I have preached several times over the last couple of years on the sin of racism. Now, as we continue Respect Life Month, I want to point out that being pro-life is broader than just the issues of abortion, euthanasia, and medical ethics. Pope Francis writes, quote, the call to holiness requires a firm and passionate defense of the innocent unborn. Equally sacred are the lives of the poor, those already born, the destitute, the abandoned, and the underprivileged, the vulnerable, infirm, and elderly, the victims of human trafficking, new forms of slavery, and every form of rejection. Most of us probably don't think of immigration, health care, economic justice, racism, and care for the environment as respect life issues. 
But as Pope Francis points out, that once we have saved a life, the lives of all those already born are to be respected and protected too. At our border, many arriving families endure separation, inhumane treatment, and lack of due process, while those fleeing persecution and violence face heightened barriers to seeking refuge and asylum. As we seek solutions, we must ensure that we receive refugees, asylum seekers, and other migrants in the light of the teaching of Christ and the church while assuring the security of our citizens, Jesus reminds us to welcome the stranger. Another respect life issue is affordable and accessible health care. It is an essential safeguard of human life and a fundamental human right. Health care needs to be rooted in values that respect human dignity, protect human life, respect the principle of subsidiarity, and meet the needs of the poor and uninsured and other vulnerable populations. We should be scandalized that in a nation as prosperous as ours, that poverty, homelessness, homelessness and hunger still affect a significant portion of the population. Many people cannot find work that pays a wage to provide for basic human needs. Care for creation is a moral issue. Protecting the land, water, and air we share is a religious duty of stewardship and reflects our responsibility to born and unborn children who are most vulnerable to environmental assault. We must answer the question Pope Francis poses what kind of world do we want to leave to those who come after us and to children who are now growing up? The wound of racism continues to fester as blindness to systemic injustice keeps our brothers and sisters of various ethnic backgrounds from being treated with the dignity and respect that is God-given. Our bishops state, we call on Catholics, fellow Christians, and all people of good will to help stop all racially motivated discriminatory actions and attitudes, for they are attacks against human life and dignity and are contrary to gospel values. At all levels of society, there is a great need for leadership that models love for righteousness as well as the virtues of justice, prudence, courage, and temperance. Our commitment as a people of faith to imitate Christ's love and compassion should challenge us to serve as models of civil dialogue, especially in a context where discourse is eroding at all levels of society. Where we live, work, and worship, we need to understand before seeking to be understood, to treat with respect those with whom we disagree, to dismantle stereotypes and build productive conversations in place of bitterness, sarcasm, and hatred. In the gospel today, Jesus' opponents try to entrap him on the question of taxation. Jesus' response is, repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. Caesar's image and inscription are on the Roman coins, thus they belong to Caesar, Jesus says. Jesus does not ask, but the next question is implied. Where do we find the image and inscription of God? This past Wednesday, I celebrated Mass at All Saints Catholic Academy and asked that question to the seventh, fourth, and first graders who were present for Mass as today's readings were used for that Mass. I thought it would take a bit of prodding and coaxing before someone came up with the right answer. Immediately, the first kid I called on, a fourth grader, stunned me with the right answer. Where is God's image 
an inscription found? He answered, in us. Indeed, that is the correct answer. God created every human person in his image and inscribed his law on our hearts. No matter what their allegiance to Rome, Jesus' message to his opponents is that they belong to God. Caesar may claim the coins to be his own, but he cannot claim people, and neither can our government. We are claimed by God. We are gods. We belong to him. We must repay to God what belongs to God. How do we do this? We do this by giving God our primary allegiance, putting God and his law first before nations or kingdoms, political or economic systems, institutions or ideologies. In doing so and living his law, we build God's kingdom on earth and then the gospel comes to life. And remember, as St. Paul writes in his letter to the Philippians, that our true citizenship is in heaven. I certainly endorse that. <laughs>